Hello and welcome to our latest episode of 15 Minutes With. As always, I'm your host, Sam Dostler. Today, we are excited to be joined by Lisa Fern Burroughs. For decades, Lisa has been one of the top players in the state, and recently she traveled to Alaska to compete in the U.S. Senior Women's Amateur. Hello, Lisa, and thank you for taking a few minutes to join us. You are quite welcome. Lisa, let's, let's jump into it. Uh, what's your golf background? Tell us a little bit about how you got into the game and what your career in golf has been like. Okay, well, let's start with uh, how I'm engaged right now. Right now, I'm, uh, I'm the secretary of SNUGA, one of the women's golf associations in Connecticut. Uh, I'm also the second vice president of uh, CWGA. Um, I'm also on the uh, PME scholarship committee uh, relevant to CWGA. Um, they give... Uh, scholarships out to uh, girl golfers of, of any background. Um, I'm also on the Connecticut Golf Hall of Fame committee. And um, let's see, I think there's one. Of the, oh yeah, I did this past two years. I've, uh, I've been uh, a volunteer with uh, the Ridgefield uh, Girls Golf High School golf team. So that's kind of how I'm involved with golf right now. There's so many ways you can do that. Um, but how I got started in golf, um, it goes back to, um, uh, I guess as a kid, I always wanted to learn, but didn't have the means to do it. I remember uh, uh, asking my mother, because I grew up in Agua, Massachusetts, could I caddy at the local uh, club? And she's like, no, no, I don't want you. I don't want you doing that. So it was, that was the first seed that was planted. And then, of course, uh, more famously, um, I met my future husband, who um, you know has the the Boros connection. He was a nephew of Julius Boros, and I said, "Hey, can you teach me how to play golf?" And he's like, "No, I'm not going to teach you." He says, "But I'll pay for lessons," and it's kind of it's kind of history. After that, he he would always say. Um, I created a monster. Um, I've got the name. You've got the game. And there's one other comment, but I don't know if that's appropriate <laughs> for this media. <laughs> what, um, what is it about the game that drew you in? What, what hooked you to the game? What made you interested in, in the sport? Um, well, my, my first love of sport was uh, baseball and softball. I grew up watching the Red Sox and then I wanted to play uh, so I started playing in a church league I think when I was eight or ten years old and um, you know so I, I always loved sports I was wanted to play sports so I kind of knew that golf you could take almost take yourself to the grave with with golf and some of the other sports you can only play so long but golf as we know that's not true you know it's multi-generational and when did you get how did how did you get into the competitive golf scene i mean you've been playing in our events connecticut state golf association association events for years along with cwga snuga numerous usga events uh how did that transition happen for you um I would say I cut my teeth on the club championship at Deep Fairchild Wheeler. Um, and uh, I don't think I won the first one I played in, but I mean, that was at the time that was a big deal for me. And then uh, at that time, they still published uh, golf scores in the newspaper. And I think at one point I was looking at, um, the scores for the, the women's state amateur. And I'm looking at this, you know, not the winning scores, but some of the scores in the field that there was a 95. I'm like, I can shoot 95. Maybe I should play in that. So I, I guess that's kind of one of the ways that it triggered me. Um, I think my first state amateur was at Richter Park, probably in 95, if I had to guess. And uh, I asked Lance, my husband, to caddy for me. And, uh, and so he did, and we're driving 
from where I live in Shelton up to Danbury. And he's nervous. He's getting so nervous. I wasn't nervous. And then on, next thing you know, I was nervous and I didn't even make the cut. <laughs> uh, let's fast forward now to, to just recently. You, you, as we mentioned off the top, you, you went to Alaska to compete in the U.S. Senior Women's Amateur. But you, you had a bit of a health scare before that. Uh, we saw you at our Connecticut Women's Amateur. Um, but tell us a little bit about what happened and, and how you were able to get back onto the course so quickly. Um, so the amateur, I think, was the sixth and the seventh. And I had a Zoom call with uh, Mount Sinai in New York on the fifth. So I knew... I knew going into the amateur that I, I had to have uh, the, the surgery. So the Zoom call on the fifth, they said, and it wasn't the first time, I, I hadn't been feeling good for at least three years. And so since December, I knew there was something going on with my pituitary. And these doctors almost said from the get-go, oh, you should have, a, you should have surgery and, uh, you know, we need to, to, to look at this and I wasn't convinced. Um, so, you know, as a retired engineer, I still think that way. And to me, one data point doesn't make a trend. So uh, in July, it was the third data point and there was no, no uh, doubt in my mind and certainly not wasn't any doubt in their mind that I needed this surgery. So on the fifth, they told me, Oh, you can, we can schedule you for the 14th. So by the time I was playing in the amateur, they had already given me a litany list of things I had to do, tests I had to have, doctors I had to see. Um, so I was in the go mode. I, I'm much better with um, doing things, having things to do. And quite honestly, I'm uh, in, in the midst of doing all those things, golf was a diversion, which is probably why I played well at the, at the amateur for me. Yeah, for sure. It's, it's gotta be nice in a sense to be able to almost remove yourself, right? From, from the stresses of the real world for four, four and a half hours and, and just focus on, on hitting that darn golf ball as straight as far as you can. Yep. Yeah, I, I'm a firm believer in that, that the rest of the world can go away on the, it, when you're on the golf course. We're talking with Lisa Fern Burrows. She recently played in the U.S. Senior Women's Amateur in Alaska. You, you mentioned you had surgery scheduled for July the 14th. The U.S. Senior Women's Amateur was in early August. Uh, when did you find out that you were going to be in the U.S. Senior Women's Amateur, because you got in as an alternate, when did you figure out that you would be able to travel from Connecticut to Alaska? Take us through that timeline. And did knowing that you were going to play in that event or finding out that you were going to play in that event help you get through the recovery process? Okay. Uh, so I had surgery on the 14th. Um, I got... I was released on the 16th. So I knew the morning of the 16th that I was going to get released, but you know, it's a whole process you have to go through. All the doctors have to see you and clear you. And um, so in the middle of all that clearing process, I got an email from the USGA and it said, Oh, a spot has opened up for you uh, at, at the senior you know, women's amateur in Anchorage, Alaska, please get back to us as soon as possible. So I'm looking at the email, I'm like, well, I gotta get out of the hospital first. I don't know if I co can go, I don't know if I should go. So I hadn't even decided at that point. So I tell my friends, so I had already knew that uh, Jen Holland and Joe Rasmussen, who are our good friends, I knew they were going, they were going together, they were traveling together. And um, so I told them, I, 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 you know, I, they, I'm, I can get in. And they're like, well, you, you have to go. You have to go. It's a sign. Uh, and they're, they had gotten an Airbnb with three bedrooms and they were trying to fill the third bedroom. 
and they couldn't fill it. They're like, we have a bedroom for you. We have a car. You know, you just got to get there. So my last doctor's visit, I said to the, you know, the underling doctor who does all the rounds, I said, hey, uh, and I knew when they were flying, I'm like, hey, can I fly on such and such a date? I think it was the 26, maybe. Um, and she goes, oh, I'll send a message to your doctor. Of course, it, now it's a, it's a Saturday, right? I mean, you don't hear from doctors on the weekend. So I came home, you know, I, I wasn't ready to play golf then, that's for darn sure. And so I'm just kind of hanging out, I'm tired. Um, yeah, it, yes, they went to my brain, but they call it minimally invasive surgery. So, you know, they went, I won't get to details, but anyway, uh, it, it's, it's so fresh. It's so unbelievable. Um, I told the story hundreds of times. It feels like, so, so I'm home, I'm on the couch and then I get, notified Saturday, Sunday, somebody from the USGA calls me. I'm like, oh yeah, um, I got a couple balls in the air. Can I let you know on Monday? So I knew first thing Monday morning, I had to reach out to all the doctors. Um, and I still hadn't decided my, in my own mind yet. And so I call the doctors, they don't call you back. You know, it's not like I'm bleeding. So they don't call. I, I want to, I'm asking them if I can get on a plane. And so nobody, nobody, nobody gives me an answer. So as I say it, I put my big girl pants on and I made a flight to Alaska. So I got on the same flight with Joe and Jen, you know, and I'm like, well, worst comes to worst, I cancel the flight. So the week goes by and now we're like two weeks out from the event. The week goes by and now I'm scheduling follow-up visits. I finally talked to some nurse and she's like, well, we let our international patients travel two weeks. And so the day I flew was basically two weeks after my surgery. Um, and uh, so I got one answer. I got a low level answer. And then I had two follow-up appointments. I had to go down to New York City. Um, I had a follow-up with the ENT and then a follow-up with the neurosurgery team. Um, so I go see the ENT guy. And so he has to, he has to go up my nose and it wasn't what I expected at all. So he's up there and then he, is not he's halfway done and I say um I want to get on a I want to get on an airplane tomorrow and he goes you can't fly and and now I'm I'm like okay you finish what you're doing and then we'll talk so he's done and I'm almost ready to pass out uh because of what he's done to me and and he's I'm like laying in the chair I go okay what's the worst case scenario he goes, worst case scenario is you bleed profusely through your nose and they have to divert the plane. I'm like, okay, um, I'm not an idiot. I get it. And I thought at that point, I was going to have to cancel a flight. Uh, so I, I'm like, okay, well, I'm seeing the neurosurgery team in a couple hours. Uh, I said, do you mind if I ask them? He's like, okay, you can ask them. I'm very conservative about these things, he says to me. So I take a cab. I go to going to the neurosurgery visit, and this is where the story gets um, serendipitous. I think is the appropriate word. So the, the the physician's assistant, who I'd seen over Zoom before, walks into the the room, and she. She's huge, she's tall. This is like the tallest woman I can remember seeing in recent memory. And so she pulls me into her room and she's like, well, how did, how did the, uh, your last doctor visit go? I'm like, well, I didn't like what he did, but I really didn't like what he had to say. And she goes, well, well, I know what he did was very unpleasant. She said, but what did he have to say? And I said, 
um, well, he told me I, I can't get on a plane tomorrow. I said, I want to get on a plane. And then I tell her about uh, flying to Alaska and that it's a USGA event and what it means as an amateur golfer to play in a USGA event. And I explained to her, it's like going to the Olympics of golf. And she goes, well, Lisa, I get it. And then she points to a picture up on her wall and it's her, I don't know, maybe 10, 15 years ago playing basketball. And she goes, Lisa, I played basketball for George Washington University and we went to the sweet 16, I get it. So then she says, okay. And then she asked me about all my symptoms and everything had gone happy path. So she goes, okay, here's what we're gonna do. You're gonna have blood work tomorrow. If it's over this number, you can fly. And um, if you bleed on the plane, you're gonna stick Tampax up your nose. And, and she gives me all these very specific, you know, mitigating things to do, not just an answer, no, you can't go. I'm like, okay. So next day comes, I'm all packed already. I'm ready to go. And uh, so my friends pick me up. We drive down to New Jersey. Um, we decided to have breakfast down there before our 3 p.m. flight. And so now I'm waiting for my blood work test to come in. So now it's actually the day of the flight and I still don't know that I'm going. And um, so we're in the car ready to go to the airport. I'm like, okay, worst case scenario, I, you know, I'm your ride to the airport today. Um, so the blood work results come in. I'm in the car. I look at it. I'm like, oh, I'm going. I'm going. <laughs> so that's kind of how I got there. Um, I still wasn't 100 percent, but having gone to USGA events before, I knew that um, the two practice rounds. I knew I, if I wanted to, I could, I could play nine holes each day and sort of make it easier on myself. So that's exactly what I did. I played nine first practice round and the other nine, the second practice round. And then you just cross my finger for, for qualifying. So uh, as I have said to other people, my objective was to not finish DFL in the event. Wow. That's, that's quite the story, Lisa. We're talking with Lisa Fernburros about her experience uh, leading up to and getting to the U S senior women's amateur Let's talk about the golf there. What was golf in Alaska like? Had you ever been to Alaska before? Is it a different game? Because, I mean, I've never been there, but I would imagine, I know the landscape's different than, than it is in any, any, uh, in any other part of the lower 48. Um, the USGA had done major renovations on that golf course. Um, uh, so all the bunkers were redone. The bunkers looked different than any bunker I'd ever seen. It was actually, they were actually dark gray, almost not quite black. Um, I guess they used local uh, volcanic ash or some volcanic sand or something. So that in itself looked different. Um, you know, we're used to playing golf around here where you see condos and houses or commercial buildings or there's roads that go by. Um, there was nothing. You were almost, almost in the wilderness. Um, so with the recent renovations, the USJ had accommodated things with rulings. Like if you were on a sod scene, you got relief. So because of the short, short golf season they, they had there, the, the uh, changes they made to the course hadn't completely took hold. In fact, some of the uh, locals had said they had really just recently improved the conditions of the course were a lot worse just two, three weeks ago. Um, you know, it was, it wasn't flat. It was obviously hilly and, and rolling. Um, it was a, a few blind shots, um, but I guess the, the most distinctive part of the course is that if you didn't stay in the fairway, you were, I called it in the frontier, you know, Alaska, the last frontier. So in fact, one girl I played with, um, 
she was, I had to go all the way to Alaska to meet a woman from Massachusetts. Uh, I gave her the nickname Frontier Girl and she liked it. So she's now Frontier Girl. <laughs> what about off the course? Uh, Cause you guys were there a few days after you finished playing as well. You traveled Jen Holland, Jill Rasmussen. Uh, did you get to experience any of Alaska off the course? Absolutely. Um, you know, it, I, it was one miracle too, too many to ask for, for me to make it to match play. So I was fine with that. Um, jo had put herself in position the first day. If she had played the same the second day to make it to match play. And Jen Holland, whenever she plays in an event like this, she always makes match play. So one of us was, two of us were disappointed. One of us wasn't. I, I, and so we all decided that, you know, we were going to be tourists. So we went on a Alaska Grace Glacier cruise. Um, we went to a wildlife conservation area to see the moose, the bears, the elk. Uh, we hiked up the top part of a mountain after a gondola ride the, that same day. And then almost, well, it was, um, we kept doing something better every day. <laughs> and and uh, so almost the last day we were there, we took a helicopter ride out to a, a glacier. It's just, I, I mean, I never thought I wanted to go to Alaska, but now that I've been there, I, I was wrong, you know? And, and I have to say that the reason why I got there is because a lot of people didn't want to go, except people didn't make it. Uh, people who qualified chose not to go. It wasn't a cheap. Uh, trip to get there you couldn't obviously drive um and um but uh so it, i guess it was meant to be i don't know for sure yeah i mean everything you hear about alaska it's just a, a spectacular place back with lisa fern burroughs a couple more lisa before we let you go and and, and let's bring it back what five thousand miles six thousand miles to the east to connecticut outside of golf um what, what are your hobbies? What are some of the things you, you like to do, especially now that you're retired? Uh, I, um, I have a garden. Um, I do all my own yard work. Uh, I do a little bit of woodworking, not so much, you know, I try to find things to do during the winter. Um, I'm uh, my father's daughter with uh, fixing things. Um, you know, everywhere I go, I kind of bring my tool case with me and I've fixed many of things. Um, so uh, I sell things on eBay. I have a guy at my club. I call him my number one customer. He's sort of the Amelda Marcos of golf clubs and I'm his uh, broker. <laughs> so I do some of that. Uh, um, I, and I'm, you know, just, I, I feel my fill my time with golf during the season, definitely my busy time of year. So, so yeah. Where can we find your stuff on eBay? Well, you have to know my username, but. Are, are you, if you're looking for more customers, we can, uh, we can. Oh, that's okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right. And, and we'll get you out on this one, Lisa. You know, you've been competing for decades. What, what keeps you coming back? What keeps you coming back to the game year after year? I, I think I remember talking to a friend who has now passed. And it's right about the time when I started to get pretty good. I got, you know, I got down to a low single digit handicap. I'm like, well, how long can this last? You know, how, how long can I play golf like this? And she said, well, you'll be good until you're in your 50s. But I've always kept an eye on the people who are ahead of me, who can still play into their 60s, you know. Uh, and, you know, I, I must make a few juniors work, think about that. Maybe, I don't know. I, I played against two juniors bo both days, I think, in, in the amateur. 
And, you know, if you add the two of their ages together, they still weren't me. They might have been half of me still. And, uh, you know, they bombed it by me. But at the end of the day, it's how many it takes you to put it in the hole. She has been Lisa Fern Burroughs. She recently played in the U.S. Senior Women's Amateur in Anchorage, Alaska. Lisa, thanks so much for taking a few minutes to join us, sharing some of your stories and talking about your life in golf. Thank you. Thank you very much. This has been 15 Minutes With, and I've been your host, Sam Dostala.